because she's okay. having a problem. Right. Well, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Welcome. It's wonderful to have you all here. Um, I'm just looking at people trying to let them in and do the uh, welcoming at the same time. I can't see Sandy at the moment, but we'll just wait for her to rejoin. So look, welcome. Thank you for joining us today on our uh, monthly Shabbat. This is actually the last of the month in August. Wow, the time's gone by so fast. Uh, and it's just lovely to be with you. Now you know that our pattern is that we meet on the last and the first Saturday of each month so that we can come together. It's not necessarily a Torah portion because we do that with Dr. Stephen Pigeon in Stefa or in the other groups that you go to after. This one is an online gathering where we come together specifically so that we can weigh up, we can evaluate what is happening in our midst, around in the world, in our locality, and take it from there and always balance scripture with what is happening. So we do it from that lens. And we do it because we serve you as a body and we walk this together. It will never change. That was what it will always be. I remember this time last year, um, things had completely changed and Shane was in hospital. We were doing the uh, meetings from hospital. If you remember here, and Shane was speaking and recording his messages um, on from his hospital bed. And we were speaking and I cannot believe that we are almost a year to his passing and that we're around this time again. And so much has happened. So much has joined the team as a result of that also. Uh, and it's just really beautiful to, to see how Yara is developing things. Hey, Drew, wonderful to see you here. Drew's on holiday, so it's so nice that he's joined us today. Thank you, Drew. You know, there's so much I want to go through before uh, we have John Hallam and Stacey Hubbard. They're going to be sharing. John is what he's famous for, the slides that he does uh, on the red horse and the relevance of that and why we have to evaluate it today. He has done a sterling job with his um, notes and presentation, which will be always as available as always on the website afterwards. And from the deliverance and from the prayer info insight, we have Sandy to add to that, Stacy rather, to add to that. But, you know, a couple of things. Yara is doing something quite amazing here uh for eating well honey and locusts and we just give all the praise to him it is because of him and he enables us it's in spite of every one of ourselves uh i just look around here and there's drew bowls well he's been with us now for a year officially to coming on board this time last year to help in a very difficult time and he's been tremendous uh, in the background on the it side helping me and taking over from matthew and also Shane saw something very uh, specific on him, like an anointing, and we didn't know. We prophesied to him that he would be used for a ministry. We had no idea it was for eating more honey and locusts, and he does everything with humility, and he has served nonstop. Even yesterday, we had a bit of an urgent situation, and whilst he was traveling, he was helping me with that, so he's brilliant, but you know, then we've been so privileged to get to know each and every one of you here and those who aren't in the room that will be watching later and how we journey with you. I want to thank you personally, how you have stood with me and my family you have stood with this ministry and you have brought us strength. That is absolutely amazing. And I just want to acknowledge you all and thank you for that. But you know, as we go forward, so much has happened, which I'm going to explain. So I've written down notes before the gentlemen get into their message because it's important so uh, we're going into next week we already start the feast there's different ones that are taking place already and on the for us we have gathered together and made a point of meeting together from the 17th of September to the 24th of September starting in the UK and this is for what we're calling Sukkot which it is that's the official name and where we're going to bring a time of those feasts together. In the UK, it is very different this year. Normally in the past, it has been Sefer-related people attending and eating while honey people. I can tell you this year, it is very, very different. We have those who were either from the Eating While Honey Ministry Fellowship or who also are part of Sefer, but more so our new people that have been watching the different programs and want to join together and be part of the fellowship, including different ministries that are joining in. Uh, what's wonderful about this, because we're hosting uh, Eddie Chumney and he's on a different calendar, we've got ministries who are not celebrating on the same calendar 
who will be having a double Sukkot because they're coming to be with us. And for the first time saying, OK, we want to be united. We want to support and we want to work together. So it's completely a different dynamic that is taking place. And absolutely wonderful that we have people like Dr. Stephen Pigeon and Eddie Chumney, both that have, you know, such gifting. With Dr. Pigeon, it's a transliteration of all the books, uh, bringing in those apocryphal books and seeing where they balance in everything where we are now. And obviously his mind for history and research. And that's where uh, Eddie Chumney comes in and complements the work of Sefer because he does exactly the same thing, extra biblical books, looking into specific studies like the ASEANs and other things like that. Very, very similar, very similar to what John Hallam, Eating More Honey's resident researcher does. So it's so complimentary that actually we have all these three men and John's helping me very specifically uh, for the Sukkot with the different workshops and just balancing out and everything and also presenting himself as we both will be doing. And these things are important. You know, eating while honey from the very start, well, Shane was alive, his passion, and it still is, that's something we carry through to navigate these times to help you with that blueprint to become prepared and know how to stay prepared and for me it's building community it's building Torah around the world and we've had such privilege in seeing that happening you know um so that's very important all from a Hebraic understanding because you can't understand what is happening in this world where we are without understanding scripture and you have we've We've been hoaxed in that sense from seeing it through a lens of Christendom. I had to throw out almost everything I learned in my degree, in my research degree. It meant absolutely nothing. It had no relevance to anything here. Uh, and that's how it is. Uh, what I saw is the things that we were prohibited from learning and understanding. And you absolutely categorically need to understand the feasts and where they come into things uh, to understand where we are on a biblical prophetic timeline. And that's why we've been doing the work that we have for three years with so many of you here and walking through with that. What I do wanna say is we've got a couple of developments. First, it's not too late to come to the UK, Sukkot. Please just email or book online and come. Contact me if you have issues with transport or anything else like that, and we will see what we can do. But we are in the weeks now that we're having to look at who's attending and what the meals are and, you know, catering and that type of thing. So I really do ask you to come forward with those type of things to make it easier on ourselves because we're a small team trying to coordinate this all. And I really do mean small. Sometimes it's just John and myself uh, coordinating most of these things and Cheryl from America. So we've got a couple of developments for you, really exciting developments that Yah has brought about. It's very exciting, actually. So... Because of the last three sessions uh, stemming from Wesley de Hurt from the Philadelphia Fellowship in Holland, uh, he started this time last month. He was a guest uh, and you loved his depth of teaching. And then we continued that uh, on two Tuesdays with two different broadcasts that we had. And you guys were just overwhelmed at two factors, the how he brought in, again, a Hebraic understanding and a scriptural understanding from a Hebrew mindset to everything that we were covering in those three series in, the, in that discussion. And then you were so overwhelmed with how Stacey Hubbard was bringing in the prayer and deliverance side to the same matter. And something just developed that which you didn't expect, a demand for prayer and deliverance ministry and a demand for getting to understand our word Hebraically, but more than just Hebraically, understanding with a new impetus and emphasis, all these things that were just, you know, seem so new. And so what happened out of that is I was talking with Wesley and he already has a course that he does with his fellowship in Amsterdam. And uh, it just emerged that we're now going to do exactly that course and specifically for the Eating While Honey ministry. So it's called... Lahoshon Hakadesh, and that's basically the Ivoret and the uh, Hebrew language, a set apart language. Now, I'm not doing justice to it, but I'll tell you this he is so gifted and knowledgeable in his studies of Hebrew and the language, and he's going to mix the Otet with the Ivoret and bring it all together and show us how to understand very basically to a very complex level Hebrew and 
uh, the language, but not just at ABC, so to speak, the Aleph and the Tav. It's going to be far more the spirituality behind it, the depth to that, how you incorporate that into the word that you read. And it's very, very complementary in addition to what Stephen Pigeon has done on Sefer Academy. So it can only complement what you have done there. We're doing that on the first and last Sunday of each month. So today you have the first and last uh, Eating More Honey Shabbats. And then on a Sunday, you have the first and last courses coming about. And that gives you two weeks where you can just go through the material, internalize it, let it become part of your fabric. And then we meet again. So just wait for those details to come. I'm really excited. That is launching on the 6th of October, Sunday, the 6th of October. And it's very detailed material that he is providing. And we're doing this so that um, we are equipped for these times. Now, another thing has happened over the last few weeks. Uh, I got a call initially and obviously you know you guys know that Shane was Australian so my kids are half Australian so we have that invested interest there and maybe two or three weeks ago uh, from meetings that I was having uh, basically they said look we need a presence in New Zealand and we want Eating More Honey to come and do something so that we can start to unite and come together and I listened to what they had said and just praying about it and again a similar situation happened because I've known that we've got a heart for Australia and to go in there and to take the feast there. Yeah, we've got Yakov Rishon here today. Just give a wave so they can see you, uh, Yakov. He is from Australia. He's actually part of the Sefer Academy as well and the Sefer Fellowship. But we were meeting together initially so that we could bring something with Sefer and Ethan Wahani uh, for the feast, and that's still happening. But then I just felt the Ruach say, OK, you need to work together and bring Oceania and New Zealand and Australia together. So from when the new Torah portion begins, specifically for Australia, uh, and that would be Australasia and Oceania. So all those little countries in Asiatic countries uh, and so on. Um, we are doing a Torah portion specifically for those regions. So it will be on a Friday to accommodate their um, time zone because they're so ahead. This doesn't contradict with anything we do on a Saturday with eating more honey and sefer. This is specifically for that region. But of course, you are uh, available. Uh, you are very, very welcome to come here. But it's very important that now we begin to build. I think you know that with eating more honey, it is about building community. And that is exactly what you do. we are doing. You know that we're in Amsterdam working closely with Amsterdam, working closely with Germany, Portugal, South Africa. This is different to Chris Mack and, of course, with Chris Mack as well, um, Australia. And I really can't remember the, the other countries, but this is something that is very important to bring uh, understanding of these times, of the feast, the meaning of this feast, why we have to gather together as assembly, teaching people how to do that, building community so that when we can't meet like this, you have got your units where you can support one another and we can walk in that wilderness together. And that's why it's so important. So we've got two new things taking place. The course, which is going, we've got 44 sessions for that course alone, and they are so thorough. So we're really delivering something that is going to be just a wonderful experience from someone who is very skilled in this area um, to help us become expositors and to the level that we would admire Dr. P in that sense. So I'm personally looking forward to that for all of us here. You know, I just want to, so you're aware, we have team here now. So Christine Zhang, I saw her come in from the UK. She's the other uh, female on the team right now, assisting me and as a sister ministry to Eating While Honey and Locusts. And many of you are already aware of her ministry here and how um, dynamic she is in her study and how th thorough she is. And so it's a real pleasure to have her on board. And you know, Stacey Hubbard now for the last few weeks has joined in and come onto the prayer side and deliverance side. So obviously Rainy Crossit does the Telegram prayer group that we have and the prayer requests and so on. But on the deliverance side and helping sometimes to host uh, is Stacey Hubbard. 
then you know Drew, he is the resident host here uh, with myself, but also so gifted. I was just saying to him how for the last six months, I've really seen so much coming out of him. And so many people say he's a young version of Dr. P. So that's a real compliment to have. And then, of course, John, John Hallam here, uh, just been with us now for three years. I remember meeting him first uh, at our very first conference that we hosted in Lutterworth. And he knew then, Yar showed him that he was going to be with Eating What Honey. And uh, when he told us that, we we heard it and we accepted it. We didn't know when it was going to happen. And shortly after that, we just got to understand his gifting uh, in research and so on. And Yar's used him. I think, you know, Shane has allowed certain people to be in our life to look after us as a ministry and a family and John I would say is one of those people in fact so many of you are here I uh, just have to look at Joy and her sisters and how they are personally you know to me so I don't mean it to be one person only there are so many people here we've got John Barr here who is part of the extension of to this ministry and you know Elizabeth Bass uh, she does so much technically behind the scenes and Stu I don't want to leave them out of this either but what I'm showing you is that a team is developing and building and now we are doing two things we are moving into actually three because we've got the books, we're writing and continuing to write the Prayer Warfare series. And now Stacey Hubbard will be making an addition into what uh, John has authored already and put together. And this will be our revised edition. And there will be more books that we will be doing to continue this series. So we've got the publishing, the books, which is to help navigate these times, to understand how to pray. Now we can cover this in deliverance as well. And that aspect of it, we've got the course. And now we're doing the Torah portion for the Australasia as well as what we do here. So it's exciting in YAR to see all these developments that are taking place. Now, what I wanna do is just hand over to John. He's taking us through what is called the red horse. And the study is very, very intrinsic. It's not a study, it is relevant for now. And so we have to look at these things. We have to assess it and see how it is affecting us. You know, what I would say to you, and all of you know this, we've all come out of Christendom. And beforehand, the book of Revelation in our old stand, it could not make sense to us. We had to move away from that, come out of Babylon and just take a whole new grip, an edge to scripture to have an understanding. And we had to bring Torah into our lives. We had to look at the prophets. We've had to look at the apocryphal books to have an understanding of the landscape where we are now. And today's session is very much one of those things uh, that it presents ourselves with. So that's how we are positioned. And uh, it's, a, it's just an excitement to be here and to see all of us at the same Ruach together for times like this. So John, welcome. If you just unmute yourself and you take the leading in this and Stacy uh, is going to be sharing in here as well. John, just tell me when to read from your, your slides because I don't have those scriptures. I've got my sefer here. But a real thank you for everything that you put into this today. Thank you. So Stacy, would you mind sitting in the crowd? This is a common heavy subject. That we John, we can't with. hear you. You need to improve your sound. Oops. Hello, is that better? It's too soft. Um, okay. Hello. Um, um, For me, that's still really soft. Hello? Yeah, there that's better. Go. That's better. Okay, Thanks. wonderful. Okay, there you uh, go. Choose the right microphone. It's useful. Right? <laughs> uh, so, hey, Stacey, would you mind leading us off with a prayer just to cover us? Yeah. This is what a heavy subject yeah. we're going to get into. So, absolutely, my brother. Absolutely, Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and evening, wherever we may be, giving you thanks, praise, honor, and glory, thanking you for another opportunity for us to assemble here on this Shabbat. Our brothers and sisters, we pray a blessing over everyone right now that's here and everyone that will listen. We plead the blood of Yusha over each and every one of us, our homes, our families. We forbid any transference of any unclean spirits, any evil spirits to any person, place, or thing. The only place they can go is out of darkness. We bind every demonic force that's coming against this teaching today. We bind every witchcraft force that's coming against this teaching. And we loose love, joy, peace, happiness, grace, and mercy over us today. We loose family together and strength, love, and joy over everyone. Sound mind, peace, and joy. We thank you for these blessings right now. In the mighty name of Yeshua Mashiach, we pray. Amen. Amen. Wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Great. So just should I share my screen to share your screen. Oh, yeah, share your screen. That's great. Okay, brilliant. Okay, one second. So as we move into this topic, the topic is going to be the red horse and the interpretation of some scripture because some things I've been led to this didn't I couldn't find in scripture directly, and you know I think brothers and sisters when we look at things. You know, when we're born again, we're regenerated from above, right? That's 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 the the translation, and we're reconnected or we're connected to the third heaven. So in the third heaven, we're direct contact uh, contact with our Father above in His temple, okay. And as we're in the third heaven, we're above the principalities and powers, which gives us an authority. In that authority, we have full dominion on the planet. We've regained Adam's dominion over over all animals. We've also got Luke ten nineteen, dominion over all darkness. Okay, so I mustn't forget that. The flip side is that you stand out. Darkness can see you. And I think this is one of those things that, as we go through the study today, um, you'll see that when we talk about um, the red horse and what it implies, that, 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 that's quite meaningful. The other thing is that taking the medical procedure of the past few years, okay, uh, the bite or whatever you want to call it, um, we've seen through various exorcisms and other things that seemingly that link to the third heaven is cut. It seems. There's no proof, but it seems, okay, from from feedback from the demons, etc. So people who have had that procedure would need to reconnect through repentance, etc. Okay. Now the reason I mention that is that the pharmacy comes up in a study. Okay. And people being called out and the abominated desolation, et cetera, call out through the study. So all these factors play into who we are as born again believers now in today, not 2000 years ago or hundred years ago, today in the past 10 years where things, the whole, you know, the whole foundation's changed. We're in a different place now. My father, my earthly dad was alive in 2014. He was born again. He had no understanding to the end times compared to how we are now, okay? Um, uh, and unfortunately, I didn't know him as a born again Christian at the time because I wasn't born again. <laughs> I thought he's this 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 old guy that had his uh, reading old books, etc. Sat in the corner, and I've turned to him, <laughs> seemingly. <laughs> so strange things, eh? But let me share my screen. And didn't well, realise it was just two fourteen, John. You seem like you've been more learned in it for longer. Yeah, well, I've I've been I've been studying the world, trying to find the truth for decades. So I'm quite learned in in all sorts of things outside of um, mm. YAR, yeah. which has helped me to understand YAR better, right? So Very encouraging, helps. yeah. So, okay. So, um, okay, hopefully this is going to arrive properly to you. Uh, let me just move a few things around here. Oops, Daisy's, one second. That's not the right one. Apologies. All right, I'll lower this one here. Okay. Do you see my screen? Yes, yes sir. Okay, lovely. Okay, so darkness rising, the anti-Pentecost or the Black Awakening, because when you listen to people such as Rister's Dar and you hear some of the feedback from exorcisms, etc., it appears that there is a day. We, you know, in the, the Bible we hear of the day of the Lord, etc., but there is a specific day when the veil is taken back and there's a release of darkness, and darkness can do more at will what it wants to do so this short study I, i've been looking for years to find the link between the black awakening and scripture i want to be i, I like to be quite precise and understand how things work why they work and understand you know to be prepared right we're called to be prepared and be awake so you know, there's an event here which is so terrifying that's never been seen before since the creation of the world nor ever will be what can it be what scriptural evidence do we have to show this? So in Daniel 12, 1, it says, At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which stands for the children of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never since there was a nation. <clears throat> Even to that same time, and to that time your people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the Sefer. We then get the abomination of desolation. Now, again, the first abomination of desolation was, you know, basically uh, Antiochus, you know, about a, you know, 100 BC, 150 BC, or whatever, putting the, the pig on the altar, etc., and defiling the temple. But as we know now, since Yahushua, Jesus, uh, rose again, we are the temples. So the abomination of destiny could sit w within us, which could be, you know, um, other forces, which we'll go into. So bear that in mind. 
So Matthew 24, 21, it says, For then shall be a great tribulation, such as what not since the beginning of the world to this time, no ever shall be. And except those days, days be shortened, there should be no flesh saved, but for the elect's sakes, those um, days shall be shortened. Then in Enoch, Enoch 99, 6, it says, And again, I swear to you, the sinners, that sin is ready for the day of unceasing bloodshed. Again, the day of unceasing bloodshed, not the week, not the year, the day. And they worship stone and some carve images of gold and silver and of wood and of clay. And some, with no knowledge, worship unclean spirits and demons and with every kind of error. So there's three warnings there, three voices with the same message for the end. Okay, so. So, um, Stacey, do you want to have a go at this slide? Yeah, um, absolutely. And I also wanted, yeah, I wanted to comment also when you talked about the uh, abomination of desolation where, uh, Satan will set up his his temple and what the church and the false information that we've been given over the years would have us to believe is that that temple is over in Jerusalem and they're going to be building when really we are the temple. The scripture says our body are the temple. So what has Satan done? He set up that seed in us for those that have taken the snake bite. So that temple has been set up in us. But there is hope. Don't get despair. I'm not here to preach gloom and doom. As long as you repent and ask for forgiveness, he is just to forgive you and cleanse your RNA and DNA. I'm not talking about going out and getting uh, uh, you know, this vitamin or this treatment or this or that, because that's not going to cleanse you. That's going to cleanse your flesh. But to cleanse your soul, your blood, you can only go through the ocean. Okay. So I just want to comment on that part. And then this wonderful slide here that John has put together for the day of trouble, the Black Awakening, what Russ Deersdar wrote in the book, The Black Awakening, is uh, talking about this very same thing. So what the Black Awakening actually is, is I'll read the slide here, the Black Awakening about the uprising of demonic forces for a swift and utter takeover of the society and governmental system in a single action. And do we have any evidence of this? Yes, in Nazi Germany, this was established uh, of their uber race for a thousand years. This is what Hitler attempted to do. Hitler, Himmler, and uh, the rest of his forces over there, they wanted to create what they called ubermen. And what are these ubermen? Uh, should we succeed in establishing this Nordic race? These ubermen were of the Nordic race. So fast forward it to this day. What do we hear about all the time? Oh, we have the aliens and the Palladians and the Nordics and all these different new age mystic uh, double talk. All this stuff was from the beginning of time. Nothing changes. Solomon says there's nothing new under the sun. So all they do in the different age is change the name of who they are. But it's still the Nordic race, still the same people that they're trying to create. And what they did with these Ubermen and these Nordic races were the seeds of the Nephilim, the giants. They've been able to shrink them down. And now the giants aren't like King Og, 100 feet tall or 80 feet tall or whatever, but they're average size like us. And I would submit that this goes with the beginning when you had the two creations in Genesis. Bear sheep, uh, it talks about the, the first creation. Uh, Dr. P always talk about Ish and Isha. That was human. The second creation was man after Adam. That was us. So these other creations, Satan also has a seed. Yah has a seed and Satan has a seed. Well, I would, I would submit that this is the seed that he's talking about. And they're trying to get that seed into all, the, all mankind to turn them into what they are. And we have evidence of this uh, mentioned in the book of Daniel. If you go to the book of Daniel, I believe it's somewhere around chapter four. It talks about Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was turned into a beast. What kind of beast? Well, not a beast of the field, because the beasts of the field are bovine cattle, uh, lions, tigers, and bears. But the beasts of the earth are what Russ referred to as Phidion, these demonic beings. And so uh, Nebuchadnezzar was turned into that type of beast. And who did this to him? How was he turned in? When the churches, they always say, you know, God did it. God changed him right into a beast, turn him. But if you read the scripture, the scripture, and I believe verse 17, 
says this decree was done by the watchers. So the watchers that have been trying to mix and mingle and do all this stuff for all these years, they have succeeded in doing this just like they did with Nebuchadnezzar. So okay. we get back to, yes. Excellent. Oh, okay. I got you. This is and, context that people haven't heard possibly before mm -hmm. or to this depth. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's not something you can just bust brush past. <laughs> I'm I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. I just go ahead. Jeff. No, this is great. I think one of the things, just as a note on the jab and other things, I'm currently doing, as Jesse mentioned, kind of um, uh, another section to the Switcher Warfare book uh, um, with Stacy, and there's some stuff in there that you will not buy on bookshelves. Okay, I'm I'm writing out at the moment, and you will not find it anywhere, even on YouTube. Some of it, <laughs> it's 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 uh, on deliverance. So. Um, and that'll help. So anything we talk about, if you're scared, don't worry, there's a way out. You know, our father's the way out, even for those that have taken various procedures and stuff. Okay. Absolutely. Nice. Absolutely. And I stand here as a witness because I've done deliverance on people. Uh, and when I take them through deliverance, one of the things I ask is, have you taken the COVID-19 back? And if you have, you simply renounce that, you repent, you ask for forgiveness, and you ask you to cleanse your RNA and your DNA with his blood. And then once you repent, he is just to forgive you and people get delivered. So I know you can still be delivered, you know, while that's going on. Wonderful. I'm We're going to keep questions until the end, okay? Because I want to get through the study and then I will respectfully come and see the yellow hands coming up uh, to ask the questions. Carol, I'll see that. I'll come back to you after. Okay. So uh, the Nordic race again, uh, from and around Germany and from the seabed producing a race of 200 million. Uh, this is their number that they came up with. And I'm sure this is synonymous also in Revelation, correct, John? With how many? Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, yeah, exactly. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, go ahead. Yeah, this is the exact number. So then the world will belong to us. This is their belief. Should Bolshevism win, it will significant, it will signify the extermination of the Nordic race devastation, the end of the world as they know it. We are called, therefore, to create a, a bias on which the next generation can make history. And this was a quote from Henry, who worked directly with Himmler. And this is what they were trying. So in essence, when they brought all those uh, Ashkenazi and uh, all the different Sephardic Jews, the Ashkenazi Jews and the Kazarian Jews to Germany, in those camps, a lot of what they were doing was testing. They were looking for a bloodline, a specific bloodline. This is what 23 and me and find out who you are, your DNA, when you <laughs> swap your DNA and you send that in, this is what they're looking for. They're looking for this bloodline. They're not looking for who you're related to because we're all related. You know, We all come from the 12 tribes. So this is what they're really doing when you're swabbing your DNA and you're giving them this sample. They're creating a database with all this information so they'll know the different bloodlines and they know who's who. This is how they create. Well, I don't want to go into that. Rest <laughs> This is, absolutely, goes, it, it, this is before the nine o'clock watershed. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> uh, so race-specific weapons. But we're not going to go into that, but they can create those type of deals. So. Russ Dizdar from uh, hundreds of deliverance sessions with the satanic ritual abuse, which is SRA, the victims repeatedly, the demons told him about the black awakening. So when they manifest, one of the things you do is you command them, you bind them and you command them and you forbid them from lying to the Ruach HaKadosh and they have to speak what is in them. So this is how Russ was able to obtain this information. Do we believe demons? No, we don't believe demons. We have conversations with demons, but when you force them and compel them to answer specific questions, they can lie not to the Ruach HaKadosh. So uh, a lot of these victims here, they've been diagnosed and there's over 30 million. That, this was in the 90s when Russ was doing this. There was over mm. 30 million uh, active SRA people alone that were diagnosed. Now, active means people that haven't gone through deliverance that are still active, which means all the programming is still running in them. So just to give you a quick history, satanic ritual abuse, one of the, the, the information that I went over with and Jessica, when we did the podcast is basically they split a person's 
soul. The soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. And when I mean split it, they split it through trauma in different parts shed off. Just like you take an apple slicer and you slice it down in all those pieces of the apple, they're still apple, but they're individual pieces. So what they do is they take individual pieces of that person's soul and they put a demon, they usher in through a witch or a demon behind that alternate personality. And that personality becomes an individual personality and then they can control that personality so they'll make a person into like a super soldier like uh, uh jason Bourne or those kinds of movies like that that's what they're showing you these are super soldiers they have super abilities but not only their abilities but it's the demonic behind that altar that gives them that strength that power um the the ability to do those type of things and then you have uh the initial mental disrupt the mental uh people began to show up in the mental hospitals initially they were diagnosed as schizophrenic however after further analysis this was seen to be what they determined at that time a uh, multiple personality disorder known as mpd or did which is now called disassociative identity disorder so every person that's sra is disassociative and so what disassociate is it's an actual gift from Yah to allow these children when they're being tortured, tormented, shot, drowned, brought back to life, suffocated, brought back to life. And so these rituals, this is what they do. They drown them, they suffocate them, uh, they execute them to the point of death. And then that um, person that's doing the splitting, which is called the splitter, they are usually a high priestess as a witch or a warlock and they can usher in and see in the spirit realm so they know exactly when to bring them back and to uh, create this type of altar. And so the disassociation allows that child to physically leave their body, not astral projecting, but just like uh, Yah translated Philip. You remember when Philip was translated after speaking to the eunuch, then he translated him elsewhere. What happens is they're allowed to leave so that they don't feel the trauma and they're still in the room. They can watch what's going on from a distance. So they're not feeling the pain of what's being done to the earth suit, this physical body. So that's what disassociation is. And a lot of people have a mild disassociation when you're daydreaming, when you're sitting at home daydreaming and you're just, you know, in another place, that's a mild form of disassociation, but that's not induced by trauma. So Stacey, like, how is that different to post-traumatic stress? I'm not asking for a medical opinion to everyone, mm -hmm. but just explain the, the right. difference. So if um, Dr. Uh, Jerry Mangazi has a book on the, I forget the name right now, it's eluding me, but they have uh, the comparison with post-traumatic stress syndrome and disassociative identity disorder. There's about nine different things that are exactly the same. And then mm -hmm. with disassociation, there's an additional five things okay. that are five or six things that are different than PTSD, but it's very similar. Right, thank you. Mm -hmm. You're thank welcome. You. Right. So uh, in the comments here, in the 70s, there were hundreds of people were being diagnosed each year in the US. In the 80s, they went up to 10,000s thousands of people and in the 90s there were millions so just uh continue to add that number exponentially and you'll see where we're at now with this and so what was created in 1992 was the false memory syndrome foundation by uh, peter and pamela freed they were accused of molesting their daughter and when she got 30 some years old she filed these complaints so with CIA backing, they were able to start this foundation. So anytime a person comes forward and says they have DID or they've been traumatized, automatically they get labeled by the police department as false memory syndrome. And then they bring an expert witness in that's in cahoots with this process to discredit them. So, and they're also in the hospitals, like the mental hospitals, they have these people that have been split themselves and they're working as nurses. And when they see the person come in, the altar recognizes that and then they can get that person back under control. So go ahead, John. Scary. This is like, yes. yeah, you know, it kind of, I have to dissociate my mind to this. <laughs> but it's, it's there, it's real. So, okay. So let's move on. Um, so is this scriptural? So um, Jess, do you want to read through this? Or... 
I can't see it. It's too small a font, John. Okay. So, um, okay, Micah 7 5, trust ye not in a friend, put ye not confidence in a guide, keep the doors of your, thy mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. For the son dishonoreth the father, the father riseth up against the mother, the daughter law against her mother in law, a man, man's enemies are in the men of her own house. Therefore, I'll look unto the Lord, I'll wait for our God, my salvation, my God will hear me. Okay, so Mike has given a warning there that people of your own household will be a threat. But in Enoch 100, this is where it kind of gets real again. It says, and in those days, and in one place, fathers and sons will strike one another, and brothers together will fall in death until their blood flows as it were a stream. For a man will not in mercy withhold his hand from his sons, nor his sons' sons, in order to kill them. And the sinner will not withhold his hand from his honoured brother, from dawn until sunset, so they will kill one another. And the horse will walk up to its chest in the blood of sinners. So again, the horse is mentioned there again. And the chariot will sink up to its height. And in those days, the angels will come down into the hidden places and gather together in one place all those who have helped sin. And most high will rise on that day to execute great judgment on all the sinners. So this is part of wrath. And he will send, um, set guards from the holy angels over all the righteous and the holy, and they will guard them like the apple of an eye until the end is made for all evil and sin. And even to the righteous sleep, long sleep have they nothing to fear. So those in sleep or those alive have nothing to fear because they'll be guarded by angels. But this event's going to happen. Okay. So the red horse, the possible key. This is just another translation. And you can say, oh, it's just, it's just John having a bit of a dream here. But it is actually... Um, I'm just looking at it with fresh eyes based on the events we know now. Um, it's I, I'll walk you through the translations and we can look at it together. Okay. And so, uh, hmm. uh, the, the book, The Black and Awakening, is available for free as a download. Uh, Sandy just made that a, a, a fact known to everybody. Just I just want as you go ahead. Fantastic. Okay, that's good to know. That's good to know. So Zachariah, sorry. Are we still there? Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. So um, it makes it a bit bigger. I had a dual screen. I'll send it off to make this you bit can, Yeah, if you make it bigger. Shall I share my screen so I can actually? Okay. All um, right. That's fine. The vision. That's good. We can see that now. Okay. Great. So Zachariah, as we've been here before, gives a definition. Which you know, and we so saw before as well. Zechariah's got the roles, a bit like the um, the missiles, etc. Okay, so Zechariah is almost like a mini book of Revelation in a way, and it's been used as a key to unlock various mysteries of Revelation. And we're going to use it here for the four horses. So in Zechariah six one, it says, "And I turned, I lifted up my eyes, and looked, and behold, there came four chariots out, out between the two mountains. The mountains were of mountains of brass. The first chariot were red horses, and in the second chariot black horses." and a third chariot of white horses, and a fourth chariot of grizzled and bay horses. Then I answered and said to the angel that talked with me, What are these, my and I? And the angel answered and said unto me, These are the four workoth of, of the heavens. So that's the first key we've got, the four horses of four, four spirits. Okay, so we're going to use that as a translation further on. Let's go forth from the standing before the Adonai of the earth. The black horses which are therein go forth to the north country, so black go north, the white go forth after them, so black and white go to the north country, and the grizzle go um, toward the south country. And the bay, which is a strange one, went forth and sought to go that they might walk to and fro throughout the earth. And he said, get you hence, walk to and fro through the earth. So they walked to and fro from the earth. Now, the key here, we've been told to look at the red horse, because the red doesn't, doesn't get copied. The black and um, white horse is all copied further down, but the red turns into bay. And if you look at the actual word for bay, even Strong's, when it says on the right hand side there, it says, I mean, strong, bay dappled. But when you look at the um, the Hebrew, it says active, nimble, uh, used of horses, Zechariah 6 3. It occurs also, verse 7, where indeed the context demands red. It demands red, but it's not red. It actually means swift. So we've got to translate it when you see red to be swift, active, and nimble. So the two things from this study on this page here are we're talking about spirits. And this particular red horse is, forget the colour, it's active, nimble and swift. So what does nimble mean then? My understanding was weak, but I think no, that's wrong. No, no, no nimble is, is quick to turn. It's quick to move. It's nimble, right. it's agile. It can move swiftly. It's, it's you know, it's uh, it's very uh, agile. Okay, thank you, John. Okay. So then if I'm I... Not with the reading now, because I can actually read here. And at the bottom, retranslated then, if you look at Zechariah 6, 7, it says... And the active, nimble, swift 
spirit went forth and sought to go that they might walk to and fro through the earth. They said, get you hence, walk to and fro through the earth. So they walked to and fro through, through the earth. So this horse is the only horse that goes around the whole earth. And it's active, nimble, and swift. And it's a spirit. So the spirit's active, nimble, and swift. Okay, so it's a spirit that goes throughout the earth. And it's a fast, swift spirit. Okay, now we go, sorry, about these slides. We, we have, I'm sure we've got copies on the website. Um, okay, so I'm going to do this transliteration again. So Revelation 6.4, it says, And there went out another horse that was red. The power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. Now, when it goes to the Greek, it's different. There's an issue else, a horse, it was fire-like. So it doesn't say red, it says fire-like. That's the first change. The second one is, he sits down and super, superimposition. Superimposition, if you actually look it up, is the act of putting one's image on top of another so the two can be seen as combined. So this spirit sits on top of he, she, it, and combines to give its image to it. Two, go forward um, in order that they can butcher. It doesn't say kill. It says literally the word is butcher. Okay. Like that, to give he, she, a knife, a big knife. Now, the knife's interesting to pull out here, not a sword. It's oh, the same sort of thing, but it isn't. A knife mm -hmm. is a domestic instrument. A sword is a military instrument. There's a, you've got to look at context here. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about butchering and you know household instruments, effectively. So if we retranslated this one on Revelation 6.4, we could, we could say, there went out another active, nimble, swift spirit that was fire-like, and it sat down on top of uh, on top of him to combine and give its image to him, taking peace from the soil in order that they should butcher one another. And he was given a big knife. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting, John. That brings to mind uh, what's going on in America right now. What do we have over here? MS-13 and all these Venezuelan groups. And what do they use? Machetes. When that spirit comes oh. and takes over them, they're using, using machetes to chop people up. Yeah, and that's ISIS. ISIS. Obviously, there's a lot of them. Sixteen. It's it's machetes here in Bedford. Even you know, we've mm. we've I've had incidents on the road where we've seen these guys with machetes at the side of the road hitting. It's like, well, what's going on here? This is Bedford. <laughs> it's like it's like a normal place, right? It mm -hmm. Exists, right? David Gleason said, superimposes using a knife to butcher exactly. Mm -hmm. mm. So you know, anyway, that's just a, another translation. Now, if we go further on, oops, sorry. Um, Jesse, can you read that? Can you see that? Yeah. So yeah. Revelation 9, starting at 13. And the yeah. six angels sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before Elohim, saying to the sixth angel, which had the shofar, loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Perith. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of man. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand. And I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire and of jacketh and brimstone. And their heads of the horses wore as the heads of lions out of their mouth issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three were the third part of men killed by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. From their power in their mouth and in their tails, from their tails were like unto serpents and had heads which them they do hurt. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands that they should not worship devils, the idols of gold, and silver and brass and stone and of wood, and neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murderers, of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. Thank you, Jess. So again, in Revelation 9, we have this whole thing here where we have this um, situation of horsemen. Now, let's have a look at this again in a bit more detail. So Revelation 9, 19, again, I'm going to do some changes here with horses, spirit, etc. Revelation 9, 19 says, For their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were like to serpents and their heads, and and with them they do hurt. So this last part doesn't quite make sense, but it's, that's how it's been translated. Now, if we look through here a little bit more, um, in the Greek again, most of it is, is kind of okay. I'm going to change 
um, serpent with snake, which a snake is actually what we see here, not serpent. And when it says, and the word to hold, when you look at the G2192, the first application of it is such as possession. It doesn't say to hold like a stick, hold like a ball, or to, you know, hold your hold your handbag or something. It says possession. Then it can, can, goes further down. It says possessed with disease, to do and eat and to use. That 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 whole syntax there, and it's not just once, it's through the whole phrase here, phraseology, is the idea that you're 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 commanding, controlling, you're you're owning, you're eating it, you're using it, you're possessed it. So um if we if we then put that into the retranslation, you could say, for the authority of the Ruakoth, not the power, but the authority of the Ruakoth spirit is in their mouth and, and in their tails, for the tail is like a snake which possesses the head. And they do injustice and hurt. So this is again pointing towards something which we we know, like this scopicus and um, and possession of some sort, okay, or authority and doing injustice, okay. So maybe their connection to the third heavens being disconnected. Maybe they've got some demons in them that are controlling them or whatever. Okay, that's mm -hmm. the implication. Um, so then. Fire and brimstone, little and symbolic, and that can be both, obviously. I say obviously. In Isaiah, I'd suggest it's symbolic. So for Topeth is ordained for old, yeah, for the king it is prepared. He has made it deep and large. The pile thereof is, is fire um, and much wood. The breath of Yara is like a stream of brimstone, kindles it. So they're saying the breath of Yara is like a stream of, brim, a stream of brimstone. Further on, you can see in Genesis 19, Deuteronomy 29, and even Psalm 11. It, it uses um, the idea of fire and brimstone as being wrath. So it could be the breath of wrath of Yah oh. that's giving the fire and brimstone. It could be tanks. It could be a 200 million man army coming from China or something with tanks. It could be, absolutely, it could be, or from, from whatever, um, firing things out, like fire and brimstone. You can smell the sulfur. But it could also be, you know, Wrath can be out of the mouth, it could be cursing. Could be, I don't know. Well, I don't know the answers to this. I'm just sharing another translation to say, let's keep an open mind to these things because we're living in a very spiritual, highly spiritualized season. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that, that's one thing that happens too, John, in deliverance. Uh, one of the main weapons that I use is fire, you know, just like the two witnesses are going to speak fire. So when I tell the demons fire or in person, it's even more effective because if I touch their foreheads and say fire, you know, the fire of Yah goes all over them and burns them. So that's interesting. Yes. Now, uh, when you link Zechariah to the red horse, you see that we get the the spirits instead of horses. When you link the Revelation six to Revelation nine, you get the the the, the red horse turns to fire, and the fire is linked to the breastplate of fire in Revelation nine. So I don't know if it's talking about the same same the same event. It could be different events. It could be the fifth horse. Or could be the same horse, and the four workers that lift, at least from the from the um, Euphrates, could be the four horses. I don't know. I'm not going to make that leap particularly. I'm going to I'm going to draw a line here, which I've done to say there's a possible link there. But let me just read through this now as a as a transliterated, retranslated version of Greek. Um, this is the last slide, so you can relax now. <laughs> but but Revelation six four. And there went out another rook of spirit that was fire-like, and it sat down on top of him to combine and give its image to him, taking peace from the soil, in order that they should butcher one another, and he has given a big knife. Revelation 9, 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose smoke out of the pit, and the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Now, Stacey, I don't know what you think there, but I would suggest at this point... We know that 90% of the demons were put put down under the earth, and only 10% uh, were, were allowed to remain. But I'm assuming that maybe this is the time of demonization. Uh, it could be this moment, may not yeah. be, but it could well, be this time. Yeah, extreme demonization. But this answers the question that Jess had a long time ago and several others when they asked me, why do you cast the demons to outer darkness? Because that's what Yahushua did. But the church taught us to send them to the pit. And here we see what happens in the pit. They open the bottom of this pit and, you know, they've been casting demons <laughs> they come in the bottom back. of this pit. Yeah, absolutely. They've been oh, casting dear. there for about hundreds of years, you know. So, outer darkness is the best option. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Okay, brilliant. Yeah, and you remember to that drink, draw that out. No, no. It's, but this is the sort of thing where it's important for us to to share and to understand and to you know uh, iron sharp iron, right? Yeah, so anyway, absolutely. 
as we read further, it says, Revelation 9, 13, the sixth angel sounded, and I hear a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before Elohim, saying to the sixth angel, which is the shofar, loose the four angels, which are bound to the great river of Perath. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year to slay for a third part of men. The number of the army was of the spirit men, again, changing the horsemen to spirit men now with the transliteration, were 200,000 thousand, or 200 million. And I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the spirits in the vision, and they that sat on were superimposed, possessed, having breastplates of fire, and a jacinth and brimstone, and the heads of the spirits, horses, with the heads of lions. Now, again, if this is uh, allegorically and uh, using symbology, a lion represents strength and, and predatory ferocity. Okay, it doesn't have to be, it could be physical face of a lion, yeah. could look like a lion, but it could be the attitude and the strength of a lion, just yeah. by, by that in your mind. And yeah. out of their mouths issued the wrath of Yara. So instead of fire and brimstone, it could be the wrath of Yara, etc. Okay, as we saw on the previous slide. Yeah. By these three, is a third part of men killed by the fire, by the smoke, and by a brimstone, or the wrath of Yara, uh, which issued out of their mouths. For the, for the authority, the rock of spirits is in their mouth and in their tails. For the tail is like a snake, which possesses the head, and, the, and with injustice, they do hurt. So, as I mentioned, the sepicus, the snake of pharmacia, is there. Um, and, at the, and if you, at the back at the bottom of this whole text here, it says, neither have repented they of their murders, nor their pharmacia, nor their fornication, nor their thefts. Now, this is kind of linked, I believe. Why I mentioned pharmacia in the same context as this stuff here? Um, I mean, again, I could be making big leaps to put put this together, but um, it, it it does definitely answer. And I do believe when demons are exercised and told not to lie, <laughs> that they tell the truth. And mm -hmm. you know, I think um, the black awakening is a thing, and I believe it happens at the, at the red horse. Looking at this, um, mm -hmm. I do believe that the believers will be protected. Okay, which is us. We saw in Enoch that the angels will be around us. Um, but it'll be a time like no other time before, and it'll be the rising of the... So this 200 million man army, so, um, Stacey, do you think this is the Antichrist army? Do you think this army is going to turn into, you know, basically a, a demonic super soldiers type thing? Oh, absolutely. And where it talks about <clears throat> they were going in and out of the earth, just like Job says, they went to and from heaven and up and down in the earth. There's actually stuff going on in the earth. The dumbs units that are down there that the military are working with are working with these beings. They've been down there because they don't have access to this level. They can't come up right now. But when all this happens and they're released, oh. they will be able to come up. And I submit to you that uh, the lion like the lion like men are really men, Nephilim. This is what David fought when it says that David fought a lion and a bear. That's a mistranslation yeah. because he fought. Oh. You can go to uh, 1 Samuel 17 and 34, where Benny and Yahu, the son of uh, Abishai, I think it was Abishai's yeah, brother. Abishai. And Yoav, yeah, brother. He fought and killed two lion-like men. Also lion so, men. Yes. Yeah, they're lion yeah. men. They were Nephilim. And so if you go back to uh, where Daniel told Saul, and uh, what is it? Uh, 1 Samuel 17, 34. It says, and Daniel said unto Eliasha, your servant, keep his father's sheep. His, I'm sorry, I can't read that far. Keep his huh. father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear. That's what it says. And took the lamb out of the flock. And then listen here. And I went out after him, not a lion or a bear, but after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. So that doesn't sound like a lion and a bear. That sounds like a lion-like man, which is a Nephilim. Yeah, we've always been thought that it's a lion's beard or something like right. that. Yes, yes. Right. Wow. John, take down the, the notes so we can see yeah. everyone in the screen as we go into the questions and discussions. And uh, I, I know that um, Carol wants to ask something. It's just a very good comment here by Michael and Stephanie Britt. It is said in Jubilees that 90% of the demons are locked up in hell. And only 10% are currently under Hasatan's control on Earth. My understanding is that the 2 million, 200 million, is a releasing of the 90%. Stacey, can you add to that or John? <clears throat> yeah, that, I believe that's exactly right. Because I t it uh, tells you in, I think, the book of Jubilee, 
um, when Moschema or whatever his name is, he's calling himself at that time, went to Yah and said, how can he get done what he needs him to do unless you give him some of the evil spirits? And so he released some of the evil spirits to him, but not all. So some of them are still locked up and bound in there. And I believe that comment is exactly right. So we've got 20 million now, we're 200 million, the 90% afterwards. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay, Carol, you, and then I'll go to Joy after. You wanted to ask something before? Well, I was just commenting on the fire in the brimstone that Stacey was saying. That's very important that we have the authority to use that because I've just come from Norway that my daughter gave me a 70th birthday, but I'm still doing yard work there because there was fire that had to come out and destroy some of the marine kingdom there, which we went up to a, and another place that I saw that was actually had the blood. Because you know the Vikings were so much bloodthirsty and there's so much sacrifice going on there and so much worship of the marine kingdom in Norway, which I didn't realise it was so bad till I went there. And um, I needed to, you know, showed me what we had to do. But it's always to do with fire. And I was going to say about the DNA of um because i was very uh not sure what to do when we ha we had the snake bite to pray for who i should pray for in deliverance but um i had been shown by um this is very early in the piece when the jab was coming out that to pray for only the people he told me to pray for and how and what happened was those two ladies they were sunday keepers but i was told to go there anyway uh, and they had the jab, and they were working in the tablelands in Australia, and they had um, what they had was they had the they were working on farms. They're from Papua New Guinea and in Indonesia, and they bring them over to actually um, do that. They were taken there and didn't even know what was going on, and they were given the injection, and they didn't even know what was going on. One of them had a heart problem and a um, a kidney. When I told them about the jab, because I knew about it, even if it was early in the piece, because we, I was revealed in a dream what was going to happen with a white, doesn't matter, a white dog, which had black needles all around, and I saw this vision, and um, I was already shown what was going to happen. But anyway, what happened was uh, I was told to pray for them. In fact, I was even told what was wrong with them, and they were completely healed because the reason why they were healed, because they did repent, I explained to them what was in the jab, explained to them, and they had no idea. They were completely in ignorance. They didn't even know they were going there, what they had to done, and they were completely healed. One had heart problems and one had kidney problems. And it um, doesn't matter if they were Sunday keepers or not, they did love, mm -hmm. and they used to do that, you know. But I've, and uh, another one um, I prayed for also... Um, that. So what I was just going to say that if they repent, now also one other one it was a man that had heart problems too, and he I had to go to the courts of heaven for him uh, to find out. But he actually did not understand either. He was a, a rugby league player in Australia, um, not now, but he, he was. And uh, he uh, once he understood and repented, it, this is what happened. So what I'm just going to uh, just to relieve a lot of people that have got a lot of family, and we all have, that had that jab, there's still hope if they repent. But I'm going to say it has to be on repentance, and they're going to have to have some understanding. Do you agree that with that, Stacey? Did you find that too? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. In the yeah, beginning. absolutely, and that's <laughs> what I found. And I think that uh, that's what I was going to talk about that, that's all. Um, so the DNA and the blood is very important, but the fire also, what um, we're talking about, brimstone and fire, how John was bringing that out, he uses that in people because, oh, I don't know, it was 14 years ago, I had two angels in the room and one gave me a blessing of fire here on my left hand and one after healing on the right. And ever since, I never really understood it for a few years until, until it was given to me when a lot of, a lot of things happened later. But um, I got to use that, uh, his ruach, to destroy the, the, the marine kingdom at times. That's what has to. It's got to be fire. It goes through the water. 
that actually the, his fire and brimstone goes through the water to destroy certain amount wow. of the marine kingdom in different areas, which happened in Norway just a few days ago. So, um, and they, um, if you ever see on the stones, you would know this, Stacey, you know how they build all these stones up to worship the marine mm-hmm. kingdom? They, they do this in a lot of places. In Norway, there was kilometres and kilometres and kilometres of it. We were walking, but, but there was hundreds, thousands of them. Mm. All these stones built up to worship the marine kingdom, mm. uh, which would be a lot of witchcraft and that going on at the time there too. But that's about it. That's what I was just going to go about the fire and about the Thank the you, blood. Carol. Great. That's Thank it. you. Thank you. Just as we go forward... Remember, this is after what's going on YouTube. It's going to bless many people, so we have to talk in code still and be very careful how, how you speak, please, so that this doesn't get um, recognised by anything. Okay. <laughs> okay. Joy? Just need to unmute yourself, please. Yes, I did. Okay. I was wondering, do you think that the people or the evil Ruach that are under this earth will be released when the four angels that surround Euphrates, when those four angels are allowed to do what they're supposed to do. And do you, whoever wants to answer these questions, do you believe they're in the sea also and or Antarctica? There's talk of Antarctica um, of having Nephilim there. So the 200 thousands and thousands. Do you think that that will happen when the angels release? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, no, 100%. And, uh, you know, Isaiah, depending on the translation, has, I think it's Isaiah, so nine or eleven, I forget now. It talks about um, you are saving his giants um, f- uh, for the end time for his wrath. Okay, so you know, at some point, it's all going to come out, right? The toy box is going to be opened, and then everything. I think uh, personally, I think the the realms that the veil will be dropped, and the realms will be combined, and we'll see stuff. You know, I, I think I mentioned before um, in Burke fifty. Um, it talks about the dead will rise again as they are put into the earth. So you're going to see real weird stuff coming out, like horror movies, like zombie apocalypse type, type stuff for those unsaved. You're going to see potentially, I don't know what you think, Stacey, in terms of demons, could be more visual than they are now, maybe All if right. the veil drops. Right. Absolutely. Once that veil drops, he's protecting us because people will be, that's why it says men's hearts are going to fail them for what's coming up on the earth. You know, all these things are going to start happening. They don't show us these zombie movies, <laughs> The Walking Dead for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? That's part yeah. of Aleister Crowley's lesser magic. They got to tell you and plant the seed first before they do it. So right. this is what Hollywood is there for, to plant the seed in your mind. It's a spirit of fear. That's why we don't watch any of that stuff. None of that stuff pertains to us because we are covered. We're covered by him. So all these people that are going out here, listen, I'm a firm believer. I'd rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it. So yes, I do, uh, you know, I have supplies uh, that I take care of my family with, but that's just the physical. Yah is going to provide for us. And yes, Joy, I believe those uh, rule clock that are released from the river of Paranth, which is uh, right. going to happen. Right. Yeah, right. that's that's going to happen. And once that happens, they're going to have power to do all those sorts of things, but not to us because we are sealed. If you have the Ruach Kakadesh inside of you, I believe we're sealed already. We are the sealed. And so those other people that aren't sealed, they're outside of that. So they're going to be able to sting them. They're going to be able to harm them. They're going to be able to do all those things to those people because part of the, part of the snake bite was the immortality gene. So a lot of those people, their physical body, they're disconnected. So what's in them is going to keep them going. So they won't be able to physically die at that point, you know, until it's time for them to die. You know what I mean? There'll be certain things you have to do to eradicate them, but they'll want to die. That's why it says they will cry for the rocks to fall upon them, but they won't. Five months. Yeah. Five months. Now, do you think they're in the sea and then 
in Antarctica as well. Absolutely. Because I've heard story, yeah, uh, stories yeah. about Antarctica and the this, sea. This is what Carol was just talking about. You have the marine kingdom yeah. that's very much alive. They don't show you SpongeBob SquarePants and they don't show you these mermaid movies for nothing. This stuff is real. Right. These are the marine kingdom is one of the most powerful kingdoms around. So when you go up where Carol is up north, up that way, that's the queen of the coast. When you go in South Africa in those regions, that's Mamiwata. That's the deity that's over those uh, those regions. And so in India, they pray to the queen of the coast. They have shamans that'll walk out on the water and stand out there all day. You know. Now, when you know anything about weather, where does the weather always come from? It always comes from the Horn of Africa. And I know John <clears throat> John Barr will be able to answer and speak to all this. That's not the normal route that the weather should come, but it comes from there. Why? Because they're conjuring up these things from the Marine Kingdom. In Antarctica, yes, Steve Quayle has a really good book <laughs> on uh, beneath uh, Empire. Empire beneath Empire Ice. Yes. Yeah. What's yeah. it called? Empire. Empires. Empires. Yeah. Empire beneath also, Ice. With, uh, and General one more Earth. last thing. Mm hmm. My sister was just asking, Sandy, do you think that's why the sea will be no more after, you know, like Yah says, there will be no more sea when but, we but, go to but, but see you him? Have, you have to think, before the flood, there may not have been a sea. We don't know. There may have been river. It says, you know, if you look at the old Psalms, it says, you know, it's the mist that used towards the land. Okay, so rain may not have been as it was you know, um, pre-flood. We don't know. The atmosphere may have been different. Mm -hmm. um, they talk about having an atmos atmospheric lens over the Earth. So if you imagine if you had a water thing around the Earth, like, a, and again, it sounds mad, but, you know, um, uh, magnifying the stars, how could people know about stars without telescopes? You know, how could the Pleiades be known, you know, 700 BC when it's only discovered in 1920 because there may be a vapor barrier like a lens over the Earth which, which magnifies the stars. So there's all sorts of Physiology, we don't know. But what I do think is, you know, if you think in heaven, things don't deteriorate, I'd assume. So there's no rot, there's no disease, which means you don't need earthworms, you don't need ants, you don't need all these sorts of creatures. So I'd assume that the whole vast array of the kingdom that we have now that doesn't exist in heaven or once exists in the new earth, okay, in the new heaven. So things like the, the sea could not be there, maybe, because it may not be, um, you know, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, all right well anyway I, I i appreciate it and i appreciate what you all are doing john your presentations have been so awesome the time you must have put into them to do all that you've done i really really appreciate it i really yeah. do and well, stacy i really appreciate the work that you're doing as well thank you joy thank you it's all i mean you we work for y'all. Yes. We all work we for y'all. We're all part of the body. We're you the, same yes, but yeah. the love of y'all comes out of you. I see the love of y'all. Remember, I was talking about light. Yes. Well, thank you. Yes. Thank you very much for the blessing. Yeah. So thank you so much. I'm sorry I held up so much time. It's all right. Oh, you're you're fine. Fine. Let me just quickly say that um, to the, uh, you was talking about the pit and the dark a dark place and I know that some of the marine kingdom have been destroyed some of them already because they do as it says in the scriptures you know they went down to the pigs and he, they said are you, go, are you going to torment us or really could we destroy them before their time also in the book of Enoch it does tell you also that he allowed the evil spirits to kill so many Levites at the time in the book. I don't know where it is in the book of Enoch. I'd have to look it up. And and uh, they did more than they should. Now, my belief is that that is what's going on. He's culling some of them now, Stacey, because mm -hmm. I've seen it happen, okay? And um, why is because, the, to, to, because they want to do more than what he really wants, okay? So he's, that's, I'm going by the book of Enoch of the past of what actually happened then um, with these evil spirits. So that's what I'm saying. So some are being destroyed, some aren't. So when I'm told, it's just told at times to send them to a place where he has decided to put them, whether it's a pit or darkness, that is what I was always told to say. 
when I'm doing deliverance. And uh, with the Marine Kingdom, some get destroyed straight away, and some are in some de- a certain area. Some aren't. Some are pushed back to mm. another place when then they can fight for one another. <laughs> then, I guess, but, uh, because they're fighting all the all the time with the different places. That's all I just thought I'd just uh, uh, talk about that to you because that's in my experience. Okay. That's- Great. Um, Michael, welcome. Hmm. It's always nice to see you here with your family. Likewise. Shabbat shalom, everybody. Shabbat shalom. Um, Shabbat shalom. It's interesting, in 33rd degree Mason Albert Pike's letter to Italian politician Mazzini, not only did Albert Pike accurately predict all of the players in the first two world wars, but I believe his prediction for the Third World War actually pertains to the Red Horse. He says that the the provocateur of the Illuminati needs to agitate the Zionists and the Muslims Mm -hmm. to a point that they mutually destroy each other. And we actually see that commencing before our eyes. But the other part of that is he says that we need to unleash the the nihilists. And so perhaps that's the worldwide unleashing of these split personalities, Mm -hmm. releasing of of the prisoners, all this migration that's going on, Mm -hmm. you know, into Europe and into North America. Maybe this is setting all those conditions for the, uh, the butchery to come that day, that great slaughter. Interesting, Michael. Yeah, I hadn't linked that one, but that's... Very good, yeah. Michael. Wow. There's so much more to go and look into. Wow. Thank you. Absolutely. That is very, very good. Do you have anything else that you can add to that, uh, Michael? No? No, Sorry. that's it. Okay. Wow. Well, then we've got a little bit more to look into, John. Yep, definitely. With that. <laughs> <laughs> I've made notes. <laughs> Yeah, it's so good. Um, John Barr. And just while John's unmuting, some people are asking about getting baptised in the UK. You can get baptised during Sukkot. It will be on the Saturday, whichever Saturday between the 17th and 24th. That falls on whichever day is it's a Saturday. That's when we're doing baptism. Stephen will be doing the Torah portion with Eddie. And then later in that day, we will be having baptisms. Sorry, John. Um, yeah, I got too much stuff on my little table. Um, <laughs> several things come to mind. Uh, <clears throat> this is very difficult for us to understand. We can speculate a lot right back stay right there we can speculate a lot based on what we do understand but we don't need to get discouraged because we only live in three dimensions on this planet and all of this spiritual stuff is occurring in many more dimensions than our three so we are very limited in our physical brain, our minds, these physical bodies to comprehend these things, which is why Yosha sent the Holy Spirit to be our teacher and help us do exactly what we're doing here is unpacking these things in the spiritual realm. So it is correct, we are not to fear the things we don't understand because we know the one who does understand all of this stuff. And so that to me is a comfort when I do get overly anxious about what's happening. The important thing is that we are seeing what's happening that's written in the scriptures. We we see it darkly and dimly Hmm. but we are we are seeing it and 
I think a really important thing for all of us is this is the very reason why we are we have been separated yes. from the things of this world because they're coming to an end. Mm -hmm. And we know that because Yosha said, Satan, he knows he only has a short time and he has no options. He has absolutely no options left but to destroy the entire creation of, of what Yah put together 6,000 years ago. He was he was destined to be destroyed when Yah said to the woman, her seed is going to crush your head. Man fell, disobedience. But the worst of the thing that happened there is not what happened to man because Yah had already prepared a way for his sheep, his lambs, to escape the death, the eternal death. He'd already created the way for the foundation of the earth. But there was no way Satan could escape the trap that he had stepped into. His end was destined from that moment because at that moment, the announcement, the first promise, Redeemer was stated right out of the mouth of our father. Her seed is coming and her seed has come and now lives in a human body sitting on the right hand of father. So these things are the promises that provide the door of escape. Even while we live or die, we are already there. Mm -hmm. So the fear is like, of course we fear, we're human, but we have these promises that are eternal. Mm -hmm. um, in, in North America, somebody's talking about the weather, the weather, the forecast of the weather starts in the Arctic at the North Pole. Mm -hmm. And from that information, they began to project what what the winter's going to be like two years from now or something like that. So um, that's just kind of the scientific thing. Um, I want to I want to again say what's going on now is why we are separated, and this separation is you know many are called, few are chosen. Mm -hmm. That Hebrew word for chosen is the same word for elect. So it puts it in perspective. If you're in this meeting, I would have to say you've probably been chosen, <laughs> not just called. But what have we been called? The church is the ecclesia, ecclesiastica, the called out assembly. So we are assembled here and wherever two or more, and there are more, he is with us. These are things to remember that comfort us, greatly comfort us. Can you imagine not knowing these things? That's the terror. And most people just ignore it. It would be like in the days of Noah, they will be marrying and giving in marriage. And it comes. It comes and the door is shut. So and one other thing about these, the two million man army thing, mm. there are three scriptures that are very interesting to me over the years. And I don't know really what I'm looking at today, but in, in Psalm 83, there's a war prophesied with nations that today share a common border with the country of Israel. This is what may be happening today. And in the face of saying things that we can see today militarily, Israel may not have a chance. Most 
of the talking heads are just like, can't believe that Israel keeps um, keep this thing going. But Yah will intervene. The Syrian army has been destroyed before more than once. And uh, the scriptures tell us that it's Yah that raises up the empires and the kingdoms and tears them down. And Satan himself confronted Yahshua and said, all of these kingdoms of the world I will give to you. That tells us who owns, or who thinks he owns all the kingdoms of the world. The problem is there's another scripture that says, Yah raises those kingdoms up and tears them down. That's his plan. So when you put all that together, it says Satan has no idea what's coming at him. He doesn't have a clue. He, just, he, he only knows he has but a short time. Mm -hmm. And when I look at the scope of historical record and biblical record, there seems to be a parallel between what Pharaoh faced when Moses showed up. Pharaoh thought he had a political problem with a prince of Egypt who was a Hebrew and had immediately a couple of million Hebrew slaves at his beck and call that could have overrun and destroyed all of Egypt in a physical war. But what Pharaoh missed is his, his battle was not with flesh and blood. Pharaoh's war was, was with Yah Almighty, the living God of Yisrael. He didn't see that. He didn't see it until he was dragged all the way into the Red Sea. And that seems to be where Satan is today. He can't see that he's being dragged into the abyss. And he's going to take everybody with him. There's a precedent. Adolf Hitler. He would not stop. He was totally consumed with whatever not only his own destruction, but the entire destruction of Western, Eastern, of Europe and Germany. And here, here we are again. It's the same playbook, mm -hmm. the very same playbook we're seeing, if you know the history. Um, but going back to these three prophecies, Psalm 83 states the countries around the nation of Israel, which will be attacking them. Now, these may not be political countries, but they are the Islamic fanatics. The Islamic fanatics are spiritually depraved people. And the interesting thing, when Stacy was talking and John was talking, they don't use conventional weapons. These people use unconventional weapon. They do not fight wars in ranks and columns and troops and division. They fight insurgent wars, insurgency, guerrilla wars, terrorists. They're called terrorists because they butcher people. They don't have big swords. They don't wear uniform. They just get together as a mob and attack. That's what they've been doing. So we see that in Psalm 83, they will lose. All those, all those fanatics in those nations, if they rise up against Israel, they will lose. I don't know how that will happen, but that's what the Psalm said. Then, if that, is, if that happens in that first ring, I'll call it, around Israel, is Psalm 83, there's a second ring and the nations are named in Ezekiel 38 that will rise up and, and, for, and form a confederacy of fanatics, another fanatical insurgent army to attack Israel, Psalm 83. 
That's not Armageddon. That's a Gog and Magog. And they will lose. It says they will lose. Ezekiel 38. Then what if they lose? Then Israel would occupy from the river to the river, the Euphrates to the Nile. No Islam. Imagine that. What's going to happen next? 200 million man army coming from the east to cross the Euphrates River. I mean, when you put these three together, there is one major satanic enemy called Islam. It hates Christianity and it hates Judaism. It hates Hebrews. It hates the promised one of Sarah's seed. See where this goes? So when I look at China, yeah, they've got 200 million men army, but so does somebody else. China is not Islam. They don't even like Islam. They don't like Islam any more than anybody else, religion-wise. They're very uh, strict about keeping that bottled up. But when you start counting the military units and the, the military men that can be fielded in the South Central Asia, from Pakistan to Afghanistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, the stands. That word stand means the land of, the land of the Uzbeks, the land of the Turks, the land of the Pakis. These are, these are tribal names that go way back. When you count all them up, guess what the number is? I counted it up a few years ago, 200 million. They could put 200 million Islamic fanatics across the Euphrates River. Yeah. So, Listen. I mean, this is, I don't know if what I'm talking about is real, but there's a common thread. There's a common enemy against the children of Yashorel, Jacob's sons, and it's Islam. Now, there are good, decent Islamic people, for sure. There's something like 70 or 80 different denominations of Islam, if you will. But the two major ones have just united, the Sunnis and the Shia. Okay. They've never done that before. They've been killing each other ever since Muhammad died. But they just joined forces, Saudi Arabia and Iran. So this is just something else to think about. Go go read Psalm 83, Ezekiel 38. And we've already talked about um, Revelation 9. And see what you think. I, I don't know if I'm right. In fact, I, I hope I'm not right. <laughs> um, but that's just something else that we might be looking at. Um, because it does span both the spiritual and the physical. But our war is not with flesh and blood, see, it's spirit. Mm -hmm. But the Islamic forces, the religious forces, are about flesh and blood. They are about the kingdoms and the control of this planet, this creation, which doesn't even belong to them. Nothing here belongs to anybody here. The Father, the Creator, owns all the cattle on a thousand hills. That's a thousand hills everywhere in the world. You don't own anything. So they're fighting over land that doesn't even belong to them. And it's a trap. It's just like Pharaoh was trapped. He couldn't see it. He was made blind. His heart was continuously made hardened and hardened and hardened. For what reason? That the world will know. I love this in Ezekiel. All of, why is Armageddon? That the world will know I am Yah. I am the only living God. Mm -hmm. And and it, that's what's going to happen. But we are 
called, we are elect, we are chosen, we are separated from this mess. We can watch it and we can contemplate it, but I dare you, do not go near it. Do not stick your hand in the middle of this. You'll not only lose your hand, you might lose your soul. So we we know who knows all of the answers and many answers are being revealed to us in this time. It's just wonderful. Amen. Anyway, I won't take up any more time. Um, Thank you, I John. think that's enough. If I think yeah. of something else, I'll pass <laughs> it over to Jessica. There you go. Thank you, John. John. John has my spirit all stirred up right now and he don't even know it. He started out weak and mildly and then as the ruach comes over him his voice is stronger and powerful like he can get up and walk out of there right now don't do that john but i'm just saying <laughs> no. Bless no, the enemy, the enemy's been trying to kill me for a long time and i'm, I'm, gonna have to... I'm not mm -hmm. no y'all's not, not done with me yet no, no sir cool. no sir he's in that rehabilitation <laughs> center and he's just studying the word you can hear it Oh, yeah. It's coming out. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting I'm getting a new suit of armor. Yeah, you are. <laughs> sure. We can yeah, see yeah, that. Brother. Really, Absolutely. really good. Wow. Anyway. Thank you, John. You know that everyone asks about you all the time in every different uh, fellowship. Your name comes up. They're always praying for you. Stephen mentions you and asks everyone to pray for you all the time. So just know how much the body is holding you up at this time and that you are missed. So we're really privileged to have you here today. Thank you for joining us well, in the hospital room. I, I could not be here except for the grace of Yah himself. Mm, yeah, absolutely. What did it <clears throat> Thank you. Um, what I want to do is go to Michael, but before we go back to Michael, John, just from what the, the message that you brought out of the red horse, what is it now? Because this was heavily on your heart. This is something that we have to look at and break down and to hold as a marker. So just simplify it so that we as a body here know what we should be weighing up, what we should be contending yeah, no, it's basically, it all comes down to the spiritual. I believe that Stace has been brought to us at this time to help reinforce us as we move into, you know, seriousness. When, when the, you know, if we're in the race, we're in the last last part of the race, whatever, but we're, we're definitely, you know, with the sign of the sun and stars, whether you believe it or not, you know, the, the 22nd of September, the 9th of October, the dates that are, you know, our father set in the stars, you know, he controls the, 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 the heavens um and even even the 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 dark forces look to those so we know things are things are changing we've been given so many warnings um and we know that you know we we are called to be set apart to be clean up our lives as much as possible which means you know just even even for that six weeks right six weeks let's just make sure that we 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 try and be the best selves we can be um, and honor our father and he'll he'll look down of, on us with kindness and our families with kindness and he'll protect us as it said in Enoch he'll put angels around us as it says in Psalm 91 you know and um, I, keep, I keep saying you know um, Psalm 23 is the one I say practically every day because in it I'm anointed he walks with me you know he gives me the, the, the cup of overcoming the cup of renewal the cup of of, of love um, and the, uh, the cup of humility that I, I, I can move forward um, with him in me because, you know, even the past few weeks for me have been quite tough, frankly. Um, and I think many of us are feeling that, um, certainly in my spirit, I've been quite, you know, full of fire for the, I'd say, the past, I was called that in 2017. For the past five years, I've been full of fire. The past two years have been hard. I've got covid last year october that wiped me out but it helped me with the spiritual warfare book so that was a blessing <laughs> got to understand a few few more things um and the past two weeks have been pretty hard for me actually yeah. the past month i'd say and I, i'd say it's not just me um you know just just looking around speaking to people there's there's a different atmosphere you know and um i think we have to be mindful as a body ourselves that we support each other um yeah. and that we we put that extra prayer time in. There's a little bit here, a little bit there, you know, morning and evening, you know, and Stacey's got some great morning and evening prayers to, to add to our collection. So Exactly. They're going to be yeah. added in. Thank you. Um, just excuse me for a moment, Michael. I've just remembered I do not want to uh, forget this. Stacey, essential oils and different things mm -hmm. like that. Please cover that here. 
and then we will go yeah. to Michael. So it's yeah, a bit different, but this is something that's come up during the week. Right, right. That goes back to what John just said and what Dr. Pigeon mean, mentioned as we were going out of our other program before about staying clean. We're in a time where we need to clean ourselves and be clean and we need to rid ourselves. One of the last things that John spoke about was they failed to repent for their pharmacia and their sorcery. Well, what is pharmacia and sorcery? Unless you're doing your own uh, planting in your garden and you know where this stuff comes from, I would suggest and submit to you not to use it, especially all these essential oils like you infuse your house with and these essential oils that you put on. These oils were great at one point in time, but now since everyone's using them, witches and warlocks, they do rituals over these things and they curse these things. They place their uh, fingernails that they shave down in the dust and powder. They place their blood in these things and these things are scents for demons to be attracted to you how are they attracted to you when you burn them when you infuse them in your house it's just like the incense of the old temples you're basically giving them access through your nose point as wesley went through you know he talked about the different points your nose your eyes all the different gates that can let demonic beings in not only that but all these different frequencies What's going to happen during the Black Awakening is all these people are going to be triggered by a frequency. There's going to be a frequency that goes out. We're not going to hear that frequency, of course, because we are set apart, but they will hear this frequency. That's why it behooves us to stay away from all these different things. People talking about healing mm -hmm. with different frequency. Well, everything spiritual is not from Yah. For instance, I'll give you an example. Most people... Uh, don't know this, or most people uh, never heard this before. But when you go to John 5, the troubling of the water, Yah is not going to trouble anything. I submit to you that that troubling came from the second heaven. That was a fallen angel that came down and troubled that water because when the people stepped in, they got a false healing. Otherwise, when Yusha came, he would have told the man to get in the pool, but he didn't. He told the man to take up his bed and walk. Why? Because he know that was a false healing. So these frequency uh, machines and all these different things, these new age movements, they are false healings. You might get healed from one thing, say you get healed from uh, uh, tuberculosis, and then six months later, you die from cancer. You know what I mean? That's how Satan works. He takes one thing away and replaces it with another. So I would just submit to you that you, if you are growing the different herbs, make the essential oils at home. You know what's going into them. Those are wonderful. All those scents are in the Bible. They're good to use. But when you're buying them out elsewhere, you have no idea who's put this stuff together. And I guarantee you that people are doing all kinds of rituals over these types of things. So no, that's really good. It's important because these things have been affecting uh, some mm -hmm. of the people in different groups. Uh, mm -hmm. Just very minimally but enough to give people an understanding just a, a setting here also the emdr please oh yeah the emdr that's also part of that frequency a lot of these doctors use this stuff to supposedly help your brain rewire and it's called emdr it's an electric uh like an eye gaze so they have this little they, they make the room totally dark and then they have this little thing that goes back and forth with this eye gazing and it's supposed to help your senses and but that's one way to open up demons and i know this because i've dealt with people that have gone through that and the demons got in that way they were demonized through that emdr and those types of uh new age uh frequency weapons or <laughs> frequency <Selfish>. therapies yeah, yeah. <laughs> Freud and slip frequency weapons or therapy. <laughs> Same. <you> know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. absolutely. Thank you. That's great. And you can always message Stacy and ask him if you're unsure about anything. But I, I know so many of us, uh, you know, with the essential oils for health and so on, goodness, how many times that's come up. And Amanda loves here, yeah, saying previously and again, anything that you take that is pharmacia is pharmacia. Well, you've just answered that. And I asked Amanda Grace, uh, who's a practitioner. Uh, yesterday and she came to the same conclusion but there's certain things that you can't avoid and things that you can avoid and grow it yourself mm -hmm. but we're looking at it from the spiritual side where people are using it for healing and we're actually seeing how 
there is the witchcraft involved with it. So completely sorcery uh, mm -hmm. and how people have been demonized by that. And I'll tell you one thing, since Stacey has come on board, I did not realize how many precious people in our group are affected SRIA uh, and also just by possession or uh, the demonic for different reasons. And it's been wonderful, absolutely wonderful to see um, what's happened after they've come into this time of prayer and uh, deliverance. And just what is happening um, is quite amazing. Uh, you know, it's just you we, We're just going with what he is directing, but it's wonderful. It's it, one day we'll be able to share more and maybe Stacy can share more on that, but it's amazing. Michael, I'm sorry for keeping you. No worries. Uh, I just wanted to offer a different perspective on Ezekiel uh, 38. Um, I just want to preface this and say that nothing I'm about to say is racist. We all know salvation is not based on race. But to fully understand Ezekiel 38 and 39, to understand those nations that are involved, you actually have to go back to the table of nations in Genesis 10. Now, Noah very well have meant been the first white man on earth. We don't know that for sure, but we do know that his father was concerned that he might have been a Nephilim because he had white skin. It said that his eyes were so bright that they lit up the room. So does that mean that Noah was the first uh, man on earth with blue eyes? We don't know. But my understanding is that Noah's three sons Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Shem was the brown son. Ham was the black son. Japheth was the white son. So in Ezekiel 38, you have certain nations that are mentioned. So I'm going to read from the KJV because I don't have the Sefer on my phone. Uh, this is Genesis 10-2. The sons of Japheth, and I reiterate the white son. The sons of Japheth, Gomer. Where do we see that name? Ezekiel 38. Magog. Ezekiel 38. Madai. Yevon. Tubal. Ezekiel 38. Meshach. Ezekiel 38. And Teras. And the sons of Gomer. Ezekiel 38. Ashkenaz. Riphath. And Tagarma. Ezekiel 38. So you have a lot of these Ezekiel 38 nations that are descendants of Japheth. Meshach and Tubal is actually uh, Western and Central Europe. So my understanding of, of Ezekiel 38 is that the fulfillment actually started in the aftermath of World War II. Who is... Magog. Magog was up there between the Black and Caspian Seas. What kingdom was there? Khazaria. The nation that they've completely scrubbed from history. Okay? From the other parts of the north. So in 1948, the Talmudists actually made Aliyah from all these places into the land. So I submit to you that Gog actually overtook the land in the aftermath of World War I and World War II. And you essentially have the Talmudists and the Muslims fighting over a land that doesn't belong to either of them. That land is for Yasharal, for God's people, both the natural seeds and those of us that have been grafted in. Interesting perspective. Yeah, I very interesting. Uh... I got a little twist on that, though, Michael, just on the Noah part. So let me show you this. It said that he was <laughs> shiny and bright. You see this man right here? Yes. With, with blue eyes? Yeah, albino. That's an that's albino. It. Yeah. Yes, sir. I submit, I submit that that's what Noah was, was an albino. Amen. Yeah, he was shiny like the angels with the blue eyes. In front and of hey, it, he has a yeah. From that, you can get all different spectrums of the rainbow. From but just from, like this, uh, just like this Zoom panel right now. 
absolutely <laughs> absolutely but from the recessive gene you can only get the one color you see what i mean but Amen. from that gene you can get multiple colors so i would submit yeah, he was very, an albino with blue eyes yes, very, very, very quickly um i don't disagree at all however the one thing i left out that i've looked at in my notes is you know when the woman Revelation gave birth to the child. The child was caught up into the heaven, mm. and the woman was was spirited away in a place that was prepared for her in the wilderness. The dragon opened his mouth, and a river flowed after her, chasing her down. And the end of that river was the earth opened up and swallowed it all. That river is a river of humanity, unbelievers chasing that woman to destroy her and her child. <clears throat> and all of those nations in Europe, East and West, are now full of Islamic whack jobs, full of them. And they're here now. They're here too. So I don't know what all this means, but... Yah knows what it means. And as far as the migrations that have been going on across the borders, uh, when I was in, still in the Army and active duty, I was assigned two years on the Canadian border with the U.S. Border Patrol between 1992 and 1994. And um, I went up there to, to do kind of drug interdiction but the Border Patrol assigned me to human trafficking. And it was during the Clinton administration. And they were already coming in across the border and right through JFK Airport, New York. And I read the annual statement to the Justice Department that the Border Patrol in those years had interdicted half a million illegal aliens crossing the border. In the next paragraph, this is 1992, 93, was they think they got half. So half a million illegals have been entering this country and the government has known about it since 1992. It has done absolutely nothing. Nothing, this is not new. I testify to that because I was there watching it. So I think maybe this is the river that's been let loose from the mouth of the dragon, chasing the woman into the wilderness where she had fled. And that would be probably places like Siberia, the jungles of Africa, and the North American continent from the time of colonial days when people were leaving Europe to get away from religious persecution because they wanted to be believers and not part of the Roman church, which is church of Satan. That's terrible, but that's a fact. So thank, thank Yah that we are and have been in our being separated from this insanity. Thanks, John. Yeah. Um, uh, look, there's three people with hands up, so I want to give you the opportunity to ask or speak. So it was Angela first, then Penny, and then Rena. So Angela. Hello, everyone. You're all having a blessed day. Um, have a question, Stacy. Yes, ma'am. Um, I've been using essential oils for a long time um, because my daughter can't take things by mouth and it helps her. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very picky about where I get my oils from. Um, and I don't have room to set up my own little chemistry room to mm -hmm. process oils myself. Mm -hmm. um, since we have authority, can we not pray? over our essential oils and break any and all spells cast by witchcraft or any other 
form. So the essential oils that we create to help heal our issues or other people's issues in our family, um, would that work? Well, <clears throat> I can't say yes or no. I cancel curses on everything that I eat because they, they've been poisonous since the 50s and 60s. This isn't new. You know, they, they got yes. it in the air through smart dust. They got it everywhere. So just pray over it. That's between you and Yah. If you feel comfortable and Yah is leading in you that in that direction, by all means do that if that's what helps her. Cancel any curses over that, pray over that, and go forward with what you have to do. I just, I, I'm not in the position where I have to use them, so I don't use them anymore. And I've repented for using them because I did use them all the time. I always had an infuser in my house until I found this out. So I would say you take this to Yah in prayer, pray over it and pray over those, you know, but if you can find the simple herbs to make those things, um, I would suggest doing that as well because they're not, you know, a lot of them are difficult. It's like, you know, frankincense, those different things. You can get those plants and grow in little potters like that and pull off a little bit at a time, muddle them together, you know, and do what you got to do. It just takes a little work, but. Uh, that I know how to do. Yeah, there you go. Great question. There was a couple of people asking the same. So mm -hmm. thank you, Angela. Welcome, thank Penny. You. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Penny. Okay. Um, Stacey, I just I have a thing that just happened to me recently in the kitchen. I was in the kitchen on my phone uh watching the program and I smelled a strong sense of gas, gasoline. And all of a sudden my phone just went. Oops, and it just blanked out until I lost the program. So I was like, okay, what's going on there? Is it something to do with the smell, something around me? Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> oh, well, you have to ask Yah to reveal that to you. If some, listen, if you get a check in your spirit, and Russ Dizdar always says this, when you get a check in your spirit, clear the air. Clear the air. Just start binding anything, you know, that's demonic in, on, or around your home. Anything being summoned, any demons that have been summoned and sent to you or your home by any witches or warlocks, bind them and cast them out of darkness and then loose love, joy, peace, happiness, grace, and mercy over your house and loose worn angels. Yeah, loose worn angels, but don't wait for stuff to happen. Go on the offense and do it every morning before you even start your day. Mm. set your day order your day to be a glorious and prosperous day in yah and bind anything that's coming against that order your steps to, of a, the steps of a righteous is ordered by yah so yeah. speak those things into existence right. every day you know uh, the next question how do we know if we need deliverance how are there telltale signs what good question are there talk you have things of if there's things oppressing you in your past or if there's doors that's been opened up in your past by you, let me put it this way. We all have had demons at one time or another. We've all opened doors. So yes, everyone should go through deliverance. Deliverance should be mandatory when a husband and wife comes together to get married. They should both go through deliverance before they get married so they don't bring everything into the marriage. That should be a given, but it's not. Thank you for all your help. I've been using you for the end. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you, Penny. Lovely to see you here today. So lovely. Wonderful, Rini. <laughs> I've unmuted you, Rina. I'm trying to. Uh... Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Mishpacha. I found very interesting that Yahusha never says the land of Israel. He says, he was crucified between Sodom and Egypt. I started looking up at the, how Israel, which is really, if you break that down, is the man of wrath. How it came that that was, became the land of Israel. But first, it was set up that when it happened, whatever happened in Germany, the Holocaust, they chose Africa first. 
Nobody talks about that. And then it was changed to that area. But the rabbis and Judaism first chose the land of Africa. Something to think about. Thank you. Just expand on that a little bit more. I mean, John, I think, John, did you want to say something on there to that? Uh, well, I mean, for me, it's, you know, we, we have to be really careful about, firstly, I don't want to pollute any idea of, of our salvation. Okay, so our salvation was spiritually grafted in. If Jerusalem's in Edinburgh, and Edinburgh is actually a plan of Jerusalem, if you look at it, with, with a mount, or if it's in the Holy Land where we see now, or if it's in Africa, that has nothing to do with our salvation. However, it's a valid point that, you know, uh, where we look to Jerusalem now may not be Jerusalem. And I know Dr. P has got his ideas about Africa as well. Um, there are many of the candidates, right? Even Madrid has a new temple built, as I showed in one of the other programs about a year ago. You know, the um, the king of um, of Spain is is um, has lineage back, and his his title is the King of Jerusalem under one of his titles, and he has built the temple in about 16 or 1700. So think, there's all sorts of things out there, and there's mysteries. Our Father knows where it is. We know at the end times it's inhabited, so it can't be a desolate place because, you know, the, the, the witnesses turn up there, right? Yeah. They wouldn't turn up in the middle of a jungle. So if it's in Africa, it'll be an inhabited place in Africa, I would suggest. Um, but it could also be the UK. It could be anywhere. Um, so I've looked at this. I've got lots of books on... <laughs> on 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 research for this, um, but it's something which well, I, I haven't found a lead personally to, um, you know, I've looked at it, but I, I you know, I've I prayed, and it's it's for me, it's not of the hour for, for me now. Um, but that's interesting. It could be Africa, definitely. Um, but if it's in Africa, it'll be in a place with people because the two witnesses won't go to the middle of the jungle. <laughs> I mean, for us eating well honey we always go down to the bottom line which is what is it, it the base is the bottom line is working out your salvation in fear and trembling and everything else feast uh not feast calendar round flat earth even this type of history they have a secondary place but it's important one thing with what rena was saying why you would consider like africa is i've always said this um 1948 well that's Rothschild's Israel that was created by him then you've got all these prophecies that Israel was created and became a nation on that day well actually has as it so that's where you would have credence to other considerations like that for us though it is always anything that is about the seal and working out your salvation is our basis that's why we do these Saturday based Sunday everything that we do on Tuesday working with Sefer is for this purpose and nothing else um, so excellent. Thank you, Rena, for yep. that. Yep. Yes, Stacey. Yeah, I just wanted to add one uh, scripture that people could go to and look uh, to help them understand that. And I agree with you 100 percent, Jessica. It's not a salvation issue, but <clears throat> it's something that if you want to study, if you go to uh, Psalm 76, too, and it'll tell you in Salem also is his tabernacle and his dwelling place in Zion. So Salem was the original Jerusalem. And who was the king of Salem at that time? Meladik Sadiq. And who held that role? That was Shem. Shem held that role of Meladik Sadiq. And he was the king and the priest of Salem. Salem is also Yerushalayim. So if you study that out, it'll take you to that region. And you'll know that he didn't travel from Edomia all the way over to Salem, you know, when they had the war with the when uh, Abraham went out to the slaughter and took back all the possessions of Lot and all that, all that region right there near Salem, it, it'll tell you where it is biblically. So I just try which to stick is interesting, to Stacy, which is interesting because that is also Shalom. Mm -hmm. Shalom also, exactly. So that's our second witness. That's why you can go there and find out where that is scripturally, and it'll tell you. Just study and, it out yourself. <laughs> and Abraham went to fight the kings of Sodom. Yes, but if you look at that, there were different ones. It was not just the kings of Sodom. It was different. Yeah, five different regions, yes. Yeah, brought mm -hmm. together. 
mm -hmm. in all those five different regions will tell you exactly where it was when you study it out. So very good. <laughs> Yes, I love how today yeah. it's gone in all different directions, but stemming to the one point. That's brilliant. That's absolutely yeah. brilliant. Thank you, Rainey. Yeah. And Sofet, I think it is. Sorry, I've taken my glasses off if I pronounced your name wrong. It's uh, Sophie. So uh, it's the first time. Hi. Thank you. It's the first time I join um, your uh, Zoom call. I've been following you a few times. Uh, on the um, internet, I've been listening as well, um, and I have a question for all of you. Um, I've been reading uh, the prophecies, and so has my husband, who died 30 years ago, but he was a, a, a very uh, dedicated Christian, first an anti-Christian, then a Christian. And what he noticed was that in the Old Testament, with Daniel, uh, the um, statue of Nebuchadnezzar, all the kingdoms come onto the stage one by one. Then later when Daniel had his own dream, the kingdoms, the, the beasts appear at the same time. And it appears that uh, three are warring against one and that the um, terrible one was burned. Um, and then the end, in the apocalypse, they are all rolled in one. Now, to make things short, and the question is, do you deem this uh, a reasonable um, explanation, is that my husband was translating this as that there are only four types of governments possible on Earth. A monarchy, an oligarchy, a democracy, and the tyranny. Obviously, you have a theocracy as well, but that will come later by Yah's kingdom. Now, the first time when Daniel saw them, we, the dream was explained. The second time when Daniel had his own dream, if we look at the Second World War, which is the only world war where you had an, a monarchy, an oligarchy, a democracy, Warring against the tyranny was the Second World War. The First World War, Russia was not an oligarchy, it was a monarchy. And it's, it's a very interesting thing. And when you look at the specific explanation, the lion who had two eagle wings which were plucked off, and he was put with his feet on the ground, and the mind of the, or the heart of a man was given to him. If you look at Great Britain, who was losing its empire at the uh, Second World War, and Winston Churchill, who guided them through the Second World War, we look at the, the second animal, the bear with three ribs in his mouth, and on his side with a paw raised, and the commandment was given, eat a lot of flesh. The same with Russia, you know. It had its paw outstretched to three countries, sovereign countries, and he did eat a lot of flesh, murdered a lot of people. And when you look at the um, democracy in this story, uh, who had many wings and foreheads, the uh, leopard, and who was given dominion, if we look at America, it was a rising empire. And then when you look at the fourth beast, which was very cruel and uh, tread upon everything and was actually completely burned by the bombings, we look at Germany. Now we are going to see all these beasts rolled in one. It will appear to be a democracy. It will stand on its economic power. It will speak with a royal voice, but in essence, it will be a tyranny. What do you think of this um, explanation? And I'm looking at... Uh, you, John, John Helen, is yeah, that right? Yeah, it is. That's right. I, I think. Look, that's that's a. I haven't heard that interpretation before in that way, but what you say makes sense. And I think the the last kingdom. You know, you look at the beast kingdom, and you got the beast system, the independence kingdom, which we see in place now of coming to place with the digital IDs and everything and everything else and digital money. 
which is all but in place now. But the kingdom has to have a head. And we know it's got 10 kings assigned in a day. But this is a sophisticated kingdom, because we know that it's going to run on the back of the internet, the pharmacia, and various other things. And it'll have, it'll have a voice of a dragon, etc. But what is interesting here is what you say about, you know, it'll appear to be multiple things. It'll appear to have a monarchy. So I've got King Charles there. It'll appear to be an oligarchy. We've got Russia with the oligarchs and, you know, the kings of the earth now. You know, if you don't look at people, um, you know, like um, Elon Musk and various other people as oligarchs, which they are, they're in America, but they're oligarchs. These these guys hold power beyond their companies. They're on the world stage. They are the kings of the earth, as it were. You've got the democracies um, around and the tyranny is underneath. So it's got teeth. So it would make a lot of sense that that happens in in, in a single system, which we're seeing now. And it's camouflaged, you know, uh, in front of us. So thank you very much, Sophie. That's that's uh, an interesting and articulate explanation for where we derive now. And I think we're on that cusp, right? We are here. We're in the system. We've been, you know, it's like prisoners don't, you know, if you're born in a prison, you think it's heaven. You think it's the, the place you're in. We're born into this kingdom already from birth. We've seen it evolving. But until you're called out, until you um, you look at it with fresh eyes, you don't realise that it's a prison, it's a system. And that's where we are now, you know. And this is what exactly oh, at that timing where all we're waiting for, that system's in place, all we're waiting for is the right leader. Because the oligarchs, as you say, are the kings of the earth now, effectively. Um, and they're kind of more virtual than physical. And though it might be 10 physical kingdoms in a new divide up, um, it could well be 10 oligarchs of the world under uh, some kind of satanic head. Or it could be Nephilim. Who knows? But I think you're right. Tyranny is going to be at the heart of it underneath. And he'll and it'll, it'll come with flatteries. <laughs> Yeah, you know. I, I I just want to uh, point out that it's not me who's saying it. It was my husband who died thirty years ago, but it never Bless left him. me. Yeah, thank you. Thirty years ago, um, that's amazing. Bless him. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, but it's so, it's so right for today, and it's yeah. so right for the time we're in. Yeah. And I think this is why we've got to pinch ourselves and, you know, just just share so that we can then cogitate ourselves, understand, decompress actually, because every time we have a meeting like this, there's a lot of a lot of things still on the table about the oils, about this, about other things. And we've got to come away and in our spirits we put a little spirits for check in place and mm. we reflect on it. And it'll help us evolve a little bit. And that's what this is what our father wants, this is what Yahushua wants. He wants us all to be refined a little bit more and a bit more ready to overcome. So thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Well you know we have got less than 15 minutes and I like to always release you a little bit early so that you can um, go and have a cup of coffee and get ready for Sefa for those who are joining there. Um, Stacey, I would like you to take us out in prayer just so, and Drew, I'm putting you on the spot, but I know that, um, just part of this team just to take us out of here. Um, Tuesday, it is Dr. Pigeon and Eddie Chumney uh, there going to be very specific questions there to ask both of them to uh, lighten on. And then for those who are in the UK, you get more of an opportunity to meet with them and to hear more of their teaching, which will go and be televised. Um, so it's going to be a very special presentation as we get ready before Sukkot. Um, but yes, I'd just like you two gentlemen just to take in everything that we have had here today and just cover that in prayer, please. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll kick us off. Go ahead, Drew. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, yeah, we want to come before you and thank you so much for providing us with this beautiful Shabbat. We all need rest, you know, as so many of us are, you know, feeling the pressures of the world these days and the, the turmoil and the craziness of news cycles and um, each individual nation going through upheavals or just changes in general. We appreciate these days of rest where we can lay all of that aside, focus on you, focus on your son and focus on your word. We so need them and we greatly appreciate them. And we thank you for um, being able to gather here as an assembly. We thank you for each and every member that joins us here during these Shabbat meetings and joins us at the Sefer afterwards. Uh, every member is so precious and um, it is really uplifting to us to be able to have such a wonderful group of people, of like-minded people, of people who have fabulous questions and fabulous insights and fabulous experiences to share so that we can grow with one another and become um, 
more like your son, which is our goal every single day. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for Brother Stacy and Brother John for their excellent presentation today. Um, we always learn so much from them. They are quite the dynamic duo. And we thank you for um, Sister Jessica, who through everything that she's been through in the past year, year and a half, that she's remained strong and steadfast and she has not wavered. And she's kept the light alive uh, and kept this ministry moving forward. And it's only a testament to her resolve and her faith in you, Heavenly Father, that you know this ministry continues to grow like it does and that she's presented with more opportunities to reach more people. And that is quite the blessing. And so uh, we thank you for that, Heavenly Father. And in Yahushua's mighty name, we pray, amen. Amen. Amen, Drew, hallelujah. Amen. amen. Heavenly Father, we come to you once again, thanking you for another opportunity to sit down with our brothers and sisters in Shabbat. We thank you for the Shabbat. We thank you for setting us apart. And Father, I thank you for blessing me and uniting me with yeah. Sister Jessica. We thank you that yeah. you have blessed Sister Jessica to be able to put a panel together year after year, week after week, month after month. And we thank you for the direction that you've given her. We thank you right now for my brother, John Hollum, that you've united me with, that blesses me uh, more than he even knows. And for John Barr, that reminds me of my grandfather and blesses me, blesses my soul with all of his wisdom. I thank you for allowing him to speak forth. And I pray right now that his lungs would be restored and renewed. I bind every demonic force, every serpent, every snake that's coming against him that's wrapped around his lungs right now. I take the sword of the spirit and I cut the head off a of python and every snake that's coming against John. And with the holy fire of Yahuwah, I burn every poison of every serpent that's in his lungs, in his system, that you would restore restore him or renew him back to health, I declare and decree right now, and I rebuke the devourer from stealing any seeds from anyone that was planted here today. I pray that the word would go forth and that it would bless everyone according to their need that they would receive. I thank you for the unity here today. I thank you for the blessing here today. And we praise your only begotten son, Yusha Mashiach. We thank you for it, Yusha. And we thank you for the Ruach HaKadosh that blesses us right now. We pray right now that the Ruach HaKadosh would fall on everyone here that's listening and everyone that will listen to this. And we pray right now for the blood of Yusha to cover all of us as we go forth throughout our day-to-day -day work throughout this week, that we would marinate on the scriptures that were broken down here and that we were marinate on your word and that your word would be implanted in our heart because we know your word will never return void. We thank you. We give you praise. We give you honor and we give you glory. In the mighty name of Yahushua Mashiach, we pray. Amen. 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 Wow. Wow. I love the spirit Amen. of the group. Where you go, I will go. We're, we're there for one another, but we're saying that to Yara as well. And Amen. that's how we end. Where you go, I will go. We are Amen. there for you. You're Amen. a really precious group. You really are. And just thank you for being here. We're going to release you for the few minutes you have to make a cup of tea. Shabbat shalom. We'll see Shabbat you shalom. soon. Love you guys. Thank you. Shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat Great to see you, my brother. Shabbat shalom. I'm so grateful Shabbat for shalom. another Shabbat. Shabbat shalom. Oh, come on. Shabbat shalom. 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 Shab